Welcome to the Animal Training Fundamentals Podcast, where we have fun with practical application and we get mental with the science of behavior. Put them both together and you get results. Solutions for your behavior problems and the tools you need to achieve your training goals. I'm your host, Barbara Heidenreich. Let's talk training. Well, hello, welcome back. Or maybe this is your first time listening. I'm not sure, but I'm super glad you're here with me and listening to this podcast. We've had some amazing special guests and I'm not going to disappoint you because, again, I've got a fantastic special guest. This one is doing some amazing work out there and animal training is a part of it. And you know what? I'm not going to spoil it by telling you any more. I'm going to let our guest tell you all about the work that he does. So let's not wait any longer. Let's get right into the interview. Hey, it's Barbara Heidenreich. I'm back here with another special guest. I have Dr. David Lentick. He is a senior research engineer at Stanford University. And you're probably all thinking, what does this have to do with animal training? But just you wait and see. It has everything to do with animal training. So first, welcome, David. I'm just going to call you David. I think we'll be informal. Is that okay? Yes, that's totally fine. Okay, great. Well, before we dive into your background, I think maybe it would be best if you explain to everybody what it is you do in your lab so that we can find out what that connection is to animal training. Sure. Yeah. So um, I study how animals fly to develop uh, aerial robots that can fly like animals and uh, basically outperform uh, everything we've engineered so far in the uh, traditional engineering. So think about aircraft and things like that. So the goal is really to improve the technology. um, But uh, my passion is in the science and really understanding how animals fly. Wow. So how did you get there? What what was the journey that brought you to studying technology, but basing it on birds? Uh, I've always been interested in flight. I think that's actually the denominator. Um, And uh, basically the way it started was when I was younger, I was uh, a member of a small bird uh, conservation group. Um, And so there were activities like, you know, if there were swans during the winter who didn't have enough food, you would go out and add some food. I was, you know, about 12 years or something. I think that's sort of like my connection to birds, I guess. And I've always been fascinated by every form of flight. So especially especially, uh, animals. And then when I was um, a little bit older, I started to build model airplanes. So I've also designed and built model airplanes. And then when I decided to study aerospace engineering, um, I, you know, I kept on reading about how animals fly. And it had to do, because like, you might not think about this, but animals uh, fly in the same sort of aerodynamic regime uh, as uh, model airplanes. So they have a lot in common. Uh, so if you wanted to improve a model airplane for a competition, it turns out you can make a direct link to animal flight. And I just, you know, I was just blown away by flying insects, flying birds, flying bats. And so my interest became bigger in that than in the model airplanes I was making. So there are model airplane competitions then? Absolutely. Yeah. And there are even model airplanes that fly like birds. They have flapping wings. So, uh, and it's quite common even, uh, relatively speaking. Um, it's, a, it's a very old hobby so from before 1900. Uh, there was Alphonse Pinot in France and he built a flapping rubber band powered uh, airplane. And so it goes really way back and people have continued doing that. And I've also built such model airplanes, uh, also you know conventional ones, but also ones that fly like insects and birds. Um, so, and yeah. I, I, but like, honestly, I'm even more interested by uh, just what birds do outside or insects or bats. They're, they're fascinating. So you must be a bird watcher then. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm a special kind of bird watcher. I, I'm not so much focused on the species. I'm all about the behavior. So I love observing the behavior, especially in flight, but also when they hop around on some branches or doing something else. That's, that's what I really, uh, yeah, uh, I'm attracted to. So I was thinking about that. What what kinds of things are you looking at when you watch a bird fly? Everything it does. So every feather that moves, how it moves its head, uh, so where it's looking, what it does with its legs, you name it, how it's interacting with other species, um, how it flies around trees, for example, or buildings, just the interaction with the environment, uh, all those kind of things. But also, for example, um, What's really fascinating at this time of year, uh, there's a lot, still a lot of uh, duck migration going on, of course. 
Um, and so if you uh, walk by the water, you know, during sunset, you'll notice that they actually take off after sunset. So these are birds that will start flying in the dark. So why, you know, like, um, and, and how come they can see things while I can't? And I can observe them fly very close to the ground when they want to. Uh, and I'm like, wow, yeah, I would have a hard time flying at that speed and really observing, like, you know, where are the trees, where, <laughs> where to read, whatever, you know, the, the, the scrubs, et cetera. So it's like, how do you avoid collisions flying at such high speed so close to the ground? And when you fly higher up, how do you find your way? Those kind of things. So, um, and ducks are really underappreciated, but um, they have an incredible amount of power. They have really big rest muscles. So and you can also hear them, of course, uh, their, their wings create this uh, sound. And actually, I also look into the physics of where that sound is coming from all the way down to why can they fly efficiently? And I would look at for any species, I'm just mentioning ducks, but it's a, it's a generic thing. Um, but there, so there are many things to, to watch outside, even in birds that don't seem as exciting as a, a raptor or hummingbirds, uh, you know, like any bird is exciting. You just made me realize there are a lot more questions to ask about flight than I ever thought there would be. Yeah, and the interesting thing is that we know very little about how animals fly. So people always assume that we understand every aspect of how birds fly because we just hit, you know, an aircraft. And uh, these have been engineered and designed. And, you know, I'm really excited about those too. Like, actually, um, you know, studying aerospace engineering, it's sort of really exciting to realize that you can design an entire aircraft from scratch and know how to build it and produce it, like, at the end of your degree. I, to me, that was like really empowering. But like, then if you look outside and you look at how an animal flies, and you really start to ask questions. You'll find that um, it's a little bit understudied and there's so many things we don't know. And there's so many things that birds can do or bats and insects can do that none of our aircrafts can. So um, yeah, there's a lot of science out there. And that, that's, that's, yeah, to me, really enticing. Yeah, because, you know, as, as a person who in the past has flown birds for presentations, I know there's a lot of things people do look at when we fly birds, those of us that have done it professionally. Like we do really look at feather condition. We try to keep birds in perfect feather, you know, or make sure that each feather is perfect. If a bird's lost a feather, it really changes the way they fly. If they have a broken feather, um, a lot of people that fly birds for falconry really enjoy when that bird has a really great flight or a chase after something and then they, and maybe they almost miss, or maybe they're successful. There's so many things that we do look at as people who are flying birds professionally, but now I'm thinking it's very little compared to all the things that you're looking at. Well, I, there's a lot of overlap in many ways. I think uh, what we can study um, with trained animals is still somewhat limited because most behaviors you can train. Uh, and birds perform a lot of uh, complex behaviors out in the environment that we can't recreate also not through training in the lab environment. So uh, also scientists are very constrained in what they can actually study. So uh, you're bringing up excellence points that like um, there are so many things, even in these relatively simple behaviors you can appreciate and further study. And then the next sort of thing is like, well, look at what all these animals are actually doing outdoors you know, in the environment. And it's incredible, like the interactions between birds. It's incredible, like whether it's, you know, like natural hunting behavior, I can imagine some people are enticed by that, but also just think about, um, you know, any sort of mating displays. Like if you are into hummingbirds and for example, California, Anna's hummingbirds is very common. Um, and at this time, you know, like when I look outside of my apartment, every day almost, I'll see them perform these parabolic dives. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with those, but they will climb straight up for, you know, uh, about a hundred feet or so. And then they will dive down and pull about like, you know, 18 Gs easily. So uh, there are not many fighter pilots who can endure that, I would say. Uh, and, you know, like then when they're at the bottom of that dive, they will spread their tail. And the, those tails are actually optimized in the, in the sense that the feathers, they will start to flutter and they will make actually this sort of uh, sound that sounds like a focalization, but it's coming from the tail feathers. So they just open the tail feathers and they close it and then dive up again. And, uh, you know, a colleague of mine discovered that it was the feathers doing that and they were not vocalizing. Um, but you can see such a behavior just outdoors if you have an eye for it. And they will keep on doing it all the time. And it's just exciting. Well, you know, how do you recreate such a behavior in the lab? How would you shape that? So 
like also scientists are very constrained in what they can actually study. Well, that leads me to the question then. Tell me about what you're doing in your lab. What birds are you actually studying in your lab? So I do study hummingbirds, so not this behavior, uh, but they hover wonderfully. And what's really great about hummingbirds is that they are like a unique species. They're, of course, they're, they're a unique group of species, I have to say. There are many species uh, within the, the hummingbirds group, but um, yeah, they all have this thing in common that they can hover in front of a flower. And most people think them of as nectar drinking. When I think about hummingbirds, I also think about the fact that they actually snatch insects in the, like while they're flying. And also um, you'll see them near windows because they're spider webs and they actually eat a lot of spiders. So <laughs> whenever you think about these uh, cute birds uh, drinking sweet nectar the whole time, well, also think about them eating spiders like <laughs> about as much. So <laughs> insects, but they have these fantastic behaviors. And all you really need to do is you have to get them uh, used to where the artificial flower is, and then they will perform uh, hovering flight in front of your artificial flower every 10 minutes. Um, and you can study them that way. So um, they're really a wonderful species to study. Uh, and what we do is, uh, so we only work with wild caught birds. And uh, what we do is we um, trap them in the morning uh, to, to study them. Uh, but then basically we only study the males because we don't want to work with females because otherwise we might disrupt nests and we'd never want to do that. So it's very strict. Um, and we use a minimal number of like, you know, no more than about six individuals in a study that's more than enough for us to learn something. And so we catch a bird, we uh, uh, introduce it to the flower, uh, make sure that the bird recognizes the flower and drinks nectar from it. And then it just freely flies up whenever it wants to. Then we study it with uh, high-speed cameras. We can look at it in slow motion. And then before the sun sets, well, before that, we release it at the exact same place where we, uh, the exact same place where we, where we caught it. Um, and in that way, uh, you actually have to do minimal training and you can study this amazing behavior. And we don't need to do it a lot. Uh, it's just... Uh, you know, like I mentioned, just a couple of individuals and uh, we are busy with data for years. So it's, it's that simple. And then uh, there are also some other species that I study. And those are more, uh, more uh, mostly small parrots. And uh, so parrotlets, and I've also studied lovebirds, but parrotlets are my favorite. And, and the reason why is because uh, they're really easy to train. They have a small size, uh, size uh, you know, a wingspan of about 30 centimeters or 10 inches or something. Uh, they weigh very little. That means that we can provide them a lot of space to fly. Um, so we're not space constrained. Um, and they are also really uh, easy to work with in, in general. They're very trainable and they're also actually quite smart. They respond extremely well to pointing and things like that. Uh, so that's another species that I study a lot. Yeah, and I saw you have some really amazing video clips on your website where, or the site associated with your lab there and we can maybe put some links to that so people can see sure. some examples of, of what you do with the hummingbirds and the um, parrotlets and also lovebirds, right? Yes. Yes. That? Yeah. And I thought um, one of the cool things that I saw is you have a wind tunnel. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yes. That's for studying birds uh, in flight. Basically the type of research I do is like uh, both in the wind tunnel, like in the wind tunnel, I, at this moment, mostly study hummingbirds because they're really easy to study in there. And uh, it, is, it has to do also with training time. Uh, basically, uh, training birds in a wind tunnel is more effort. And uh, I work with students and postdocs. And they, you know, they're there for research purposes. So uh, that means that they also really want to spend their time doing research and learning. And they don't want to spend all their time training. So my, my optimization is always which species for which study uh, enables us to most quickly answer this question, enables the, the people I work with to focus on what they're most excited about. So I, they are excited about birds, they are excited by behavior, uh, but they're not excited by training uh, 24 seven, so to say. So uh, you have to really optimize these things. Um, so that, that's what I mostly study, honestly, in the, in the wind tunnel. Another uh, thing I do a lot in the wind tunnel is that I study uh, my robots in there. So if when we build aerial robots, I need to be tested. And in a wind tunnel, you can easily test the entire envelope. Uh, so you can go to high speeds, low speeds, and all those kind of things. And the robots that we uh, develop very much look like birds. And they also fly like birds. So there's a direct association between you know, 
the, the, the birds that we study and then uh, the, the robots that we develop that we are trying to make fly like the bird. So I don't know if you know this, but sometimes in bird shows, people will do a behavior where they create, they have like a big giant fan, like the kind yes. you might see in a warehouse and they have a bird basically soar in that, in that fan. And, um, and uh, so I would, and, and it's not always easy to get it quite right so that the bird can exactly. soar in that. And, and so it can be a challenging behavior to train. A lot of it has to do with equipment and whatnot. So I was curious, was it difficult to get the birds to fly in your wind tunnel? Yeah, I think in general it's uh, difficult. And the reason why is it really has to do with the skill level of the trainer. Oh. So uh, that is the biggest constraint always. Like I always say, the animal can do it, but can the trainer train it? <laughs> <laughs> There's no question about a bird being able to fly. And uh, the, the big adjustment, I think, for uh, birds to fly well in the wind tunnel is getting used to the fact that the world's not moving around you. And that's not natural, right? So that is, it depends on the species, how adaptable and how much they can learn, uh, how easy they will go about that. Um, and yeah, it, like I've, there are a couple of places around the world where people study bird flight in the wind tunnel, not many, but there are a couple. And uh, yeah, it's very involved to train the animal to fly in there. One trick that works really well, and that's not really good for a good bird show, I guess, but for research is perfect, is that you could train them during migration season. And I'm not working with birds that migrate right now, but that's a really good solution. That means that they will get a migration restlessness during the migration season. And then they're really willing to fly long distances. And so that's how people have been able to fly birds for eight hours in a wind tunnel. Uh, but that is of course, based on this instinct, this innate willingness to fly for long times. If you would wanna train that through shaping and things like that, I think that would be quite challenging. So uh, a really big part, of course, is, and this is, I think, the essence of animal training, is that you observe the behaviors that the animal is naturally willing to do, and you shape it, and you place it under a cue. Um, and if you want to have behaviors that are longer, well, then you have to look at under which conditions do they want to do this longer in the natural environment. <laughs> and, and, you know, these birds have not evolved to uh, fly in bird shows, and they have also not been involved to fly in labs for a long time. So then it is, it will require, you know, like extreme trainer skill to really understand how you can achieve this. So th this is always, I think, uh, the main challenge. Yeah. And I think when, um, you know, the species that I've seen those soaring flights were with are, con are, are ones that you might be, you know, reinforcing on the wing, if so to speak, with, yes. with food reinforcers, which... Yeah that would be a little different than what you might be doing in your wind tunnel for your studies. So, so that makes sense. Oh yeah, no, no, no. I agree okay. actually. No, no. Yes, absolutely. I think food reinforcement is really key. I'm just saying it's not trivial. Like one thing, for example, that would make it really easy uh, in shows is like uh, the, the problem is often the small scale of the fan. So you would want to have the largest possible fan because like if there's just wind everywhere, then it's much like, and this of course goes back to training. Uh, the essence of training, another aspect of it is not only observing a behavior that you can shape, so, you know, starting off with natural behaviors, but it's also modifying the environment. Mm -hmm. And so the, the key thing here is uh, when a bird flies, the wind is blowing everywhere, right? doesn't matter where it's flying. Now, if you work with a fan or a wind tunnel, even a larger wind tunnel, at some point, uh, there won't be wind or there will be a wall or whatever. That's not natural. So uh, you, larger is better, I would say. Uh, another thing that I found really useful when I started out and wasn't a proficient trainer in the sense that, you know, and I, I've done extensive, uh, I've, I have extensive experience right now, but, but really the first year when I started, I sort of discovered by accident uh, some of these things and I now look at back to and it's like, oh, actually that's still working very well. And one of those things is that I worked back then with uh, lovebirds and uh, it really does make life much easier if you fly social birds in groups and they will like flying together. So like during these shows that you mentioned, I guess people fly them quite often individually, but most birds that you would fly there, for example, parrot species, they're very social. So um, you're, you're best off providing a lot of wind in the sense of like a wide area and enabling multiple to fly because they really enjoy flying together. So I flew a flock of eight lovebirds together and that was terrific. And the other cool thing is, and now I'm looking back at it, it's like, oh, wow, it's actually not super trivial, but um, I did use luring, for example, to get them back into the cage. 
Um, uh, so I provided a cage with food and I only had to get in one bird. So, you know, they would land on a, uh, on a stick that uh, on our perch that I offered in the air and, you know, then they don't have to fly. So um, they sort of like perching. So they will do that. And I've always brought in one back in. And then the great thing is if you work with a flock, they all want to join. So before you know it, you know, this is relatively small cage because I had to introduce in the wind tunnel. All these eight birds would go in voluntarily, sit together with all this food. And that was a great way to introduce the birds into the wind tunnel and get them out of the wind tunnel. Yeah. And you won't find a book that tells you, you know, do it this way. There's not a paper that will tell you. And I just discovered it worked for me. And, but I got really intrigued and I really want to learn how it works. But I would say it's a great question. How can you shape a bird to fly in a wind tunnel? And I'm, I bet we can do it better even than we're currently doing. That's very cool. And you mentioned um, the food. I think it'd be really cool to talk about what these lovebirds and parrotlets work for, because you were telling me about that um, in another conversation and it's really intriguing. Yeah, so sure. Uh, so my training philosophy is uh, to work with preferred uh, food items. Uh, so they get unlimited food, unlimited water, all those things are, you know, zero constraint always. Uh, same with like uh, important additions like, uh, you know, broccoli, veggies. Broccoli is very good actually, but like veggies in general. And the same goes for fruits and stuff like that. Uh, there's also a pellet diet that has everything in it, all the nutrients they need. Uh, so um, that's, I think, really important. And then with seeds, you have to always watch how much you give them. Because if you give a bird, especially with these smaller parrots and parrots in general, unlimited seeds, that's bad for their liver and they will become less old. So you have to manage that anyway. And those are great for training. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, even within seeds or nuts, there are different favorites, right? So uh, if I would bring in a cashew, <laughs> those would be a cashew nut and a tiny piece, I would break off a tiny piece that would be even nicer, but what we found is uh, that they, they really, really love millet seeds. So I can train a bird with a single millet seed that's very efficient. And I think one essential part of training is that in addition to the unlimited food they normally have is that when you provide them uh, with uh, reinforcing uh, rewards uh, during training, that those are well-defined units that can be presented really well. And it turns out the millet seed has the perfect size it fit, really fits well between your fingers uh, and then they will just take it from your fingers. So uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of like uh, the, the, main, the main food that we use for reinforcing the behavior. Sounds very good. I like it. So what about this, uh, this bird Obi that got a lot of attention? What, what was that one about? Tell me about that study. Sure. Yeah. So one of the things we want to do when we study bird flight is sort of like actually see how the air is moving around the bird. So this is called the aerodynamics. And that's a really big deal. Uh, that will determine how efficient a bird can fly, for example, how much force it can generate to stay aloft or to maneuver around. And those are all things that people are excited about learning about. So how do you study that? Well, it turns out that the way you traditionally, and that's the only good way to do it actually, uh, against the airflow is, um, when you add a, a, a tiny mist, and we uh, use a sort of like a, an olive oil type of uh, mist, so it's very thin, um, and you uh, can't you barely uh, notice it yourself in the space. So it's, a, it's called an atomizer, but basically the particles are so small, they're micron size droplets, you don't really notice them. But when you shine a laser on them, they will light up and you can film them. Now, when you use a laser, and even in this case, it's a very wide beam, so it's not intense. So you, the whole idea is you spread it out. Then we all wear our goggles, of course, uh, for protection. And so the first thing that we wanted to do was to make sure that our birds had the exact same protection. So what we did is we self fit our own laser goggles, so we're not using some other material, with the exact same. And we uh, cut out tiny lenses, and then we 3D printed uh, the sockets uh, and then painted everything black to make sure nothing, uh, no light could ever penetrate. Um, and so we created these miniature laser light goggles uh, for our birds so that we could safely study them uh, and uh, then train them based on positive reinforcement to fly from one perch to another, basically on a pointing cue or uh, we use a target stick, whatever works best for the bird slash student. So um, yeah, and, and that, that, that was a very productive approach and uh, it got a lot of attention because these goggles look super cute, uh, but they're also very professional. I'm still very proud of the student, Eric Gutierrez, who uh, developed them. 
and you did an amazing job on it and the study was really wonderful yeah and and obi was the one who got featured in the article or the the new yes <laughs> yes yes obi was the name of the bird sorry about that yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah and um yeah the interesting thing is like um we used habituation to get the bird used to the goggles and uh, it really, and this is another thing that most trainers can relate to, I think, but uh, there's a lot of difference in behavior between birds. And so we selected the birds uh, that sort of like had no problem at all with wearing the goggles. So some birds didn't like it as much and those we did not study. Uh, and Obi was one of the birds who felt very comfortable with the goggles uh, and loved the treats. So that also helped, of course. Uh, but yeah, so it's, it's really this combination. And we actually, in this case, we didn't need to study many birds. So we actually did it based on a single bird, which is in some ways kind of unusual, but because we were making a direct comparison, we want to know if an alternative method where we did not need to use laser light was good. Um, that was actually the goal of the study. Uh, that way we were actually able to make that comparison and we made the comparison and we were able to show that the new method that we developed where birds don't need to wear goggles or, you know, wear anything, uh, work better. So we developed this new method where the birds can fly freely and we can measure which forces they generate in flight. Uh, and we don't need to use lasers. They don't need to wear goggles. You know, they're really cute, but uh, the study is even better if it's not necessary. Oh, I hate to interrupt this interview because it's so fascinating, but we have to take a little break to give you a secret word. And the secret word is goggles, G-O-G-G-L-E-S, goggles. Secret words are important for our members of AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com who are working towards getting badges to show professional development. And secret words are important to submit to show that you've been listening to these podcasts when you're working towards some of these badges. Badges. All right, we're going to get back to the program. Speaking of goggles and things of that nature, another thing that you uh, developed there was there are situations where animals might need to be held for various reasons. And we this happens in real life with our own animals or companion animals or animals that are not yet trained to participate in various procedures. Yes. And we're always looking for ways to reduce stress or eliminate stress if we can. And you, yes. you, your team developed sort of an interesting way to do that. Maybe you can share that with us. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I think so the, the basis of uh, my research approach is that I, I really want to minimize stress. And, you know, and, and, and in addition to minimizing, I actually want the animal to feel comfortable to natural behaviors i'm happy when the birds are voluntarily sitting on front of the cage wanting to interact with us not because they want to have food uh, or things like that per se but just because every single interaction has been positive and if you work for example with ferrets they're also social so they actually like interactions if they're positive so just the interaction itself can be rewarding in addition to the food reward so uh, to me, that is really important. Now, the challenge, of course, is that you also have things like health checkups and things like that. And not all of those uh, can be trained under positive reinforcement. Now, uh, I am a huge fan of every approach you have for that, but they are, you, typically you apply those for bigger birds. Uh, and also, if you look at like animal facilities, you'll, you'll see a difference between people who work, for example, with many mice, or with, in my case, I'm an intermediate number of birds, you know, number 10 or something. Um, but you can't guarantee that you can get every single bird entirely trained through positive reinforcement for every veterinary uh, survey that needs to be done, especially because they're so small. Um, that doesn't mean it's not possible. My perspective is that if you have enough trainer's time and you have the right people and enough money, <laughs> you could do it, but then still there will be one day you'll have to question, uh, you know, if you think about someone working with mice um, or with tiny birds, if you work with zebra finches and you have like 100 zebra finches, are you going to have resources uh, to provide them with optimal care and do that entirely through training? And that's going to be a challenge. And for that purpose, for, the, for those cases where we can't do it any other way, um, it's actually best, I think, uh, if the birds don't see who is uh, handling them. And I'll try to explain this. So what is our approach? Um, we flood the, the room with um, infrared light. We turn off all the lights. So there's infrared light, but we can't see anything. The birds can't see anything. And what we do is we use something that's called a GoPro camera. Most people have seen those. We let those modify. It's just a simple camera with which you can film. And um, every camera has an infrared filter in front of it to make nicer video. 
but a professional can remove that for you, which we then uh, let a professional do. And so then you can film in infrared. Uh, and so there's a low cost camera with a high quality video that can film in infrared. And then we connect it to something, it's, a, it's virtual reality, but there are these, it's called first person view goggles. It's for people who love flying model airplanes and drones and watch through the camera while they're flying. Well, what we do is we mount that, that the GoPro camera on top of the goggle. So we're just getting the view straight ahead of us uh, under an angle, quite a wide angle. And then we can, we can actually see an infrared because we just feed the video straight through and uh, it will come across as a gray white uh, sort of like uh, video, but you can see everything. So then you can walk into a space, you see everything, the bird sees nothing. And then what you have to do is, it's not without training. Like the idea that you would do this without training uh, would be wrong. And also I wanna clarify how I use the word habituation. To me, habituation is with approximations. So it's not about flooding the bird with like something that it doesn't like, but it's about making approximations. So what you would do is you would open and close the door first because they have to get used to that sound while they're not seeing anything. And, you know, and if the bird doesn't move, you know, all these criteria that you use when there is light and you go step by step, you go in with the hand, but you don't need to touch the animal yet. It's just getting used to that there might be some air moving or something like that. They can sense it in multiple ways. And then you go to the point where you gently touch it a little bit um, and you go step by step. You're not going to hold the bird immediately. You go step by step till it's comfortable with you holding it. And then when you are allowed to hold it, you hold it briefly and then let it go. So it's really, you know, like this approximation, approximation, approximation till the point that you can pick up the animal. But keep in mind, all of this is still much less work than if you have to shape everything uh, with the lights on. And also the benefit is if you make any mistake for whatever reason, which can happen, of course, when you hold a bird and you do it during daylight, et cetera. Uh, the, the, the benefit is that this is uh, some flexibility with trainer error. Of course, you know, we record all the videos. We talk about this. If you see a trainer make a small mistake uh, and make sure that like, no, you have to be more patient, et cetera. All these things are really important, but, the, but there's no association with the human. And that's really critical. And so then you go all the way till the bird's comfortable with you holding it. Then you do that longer and longer. And till some point, you can just hold the bird and walk around and then you can do your procedure. Uh, and those you can also do step by step, but some procedures are less nice than others uh, when it's veterinary to be specific. <laughs> you know, when you have to take swaps in the cloaca, I think no bird really likes that. So uh, it takes time to get adjusted to that, but not every veterinarian is trained to do that through approximation, so to say. This, that's where we sometimes have to give a little bit, but that's, that's how it works. Then you can place the bird back and you keep on observing it. And so we've been able to make this really uh, a minimal stress thing. And it's perfect for procedures that cannot be trained, emergency procedures, et cetera, uh, for the bird's health when uh, someone quickly needs to take a look. Um, and that, that really has, yeah, I, I'm very excited about this approach because what's cool about it is that afterwards, um, uh, even if it was a veterinary procedure that the bird didn't like, it hasn't associated this with a human. That means that during its normal, you know, everyday life, it doesn't get stressed by seeing human. And I think that's really important, like separate, if there's any behavior that you have to perform, like any you know, veterinary thing that you have to perform. If you can separate that from humans as much as possible, it means that in daily life, an animal will not be stressed by seeing a human. And that improves its life, uh, quality of life by a lot. And also makes trainability much better because we all know that if you want to work with positive reinforcement, which I think is the best way, it is key that the bird always has, or any animal has, always has positive experiences with humans and trainers. Uh, so that's what it was developed for. And it, and it works quite well. It doesn't cost much. It's about $600. You can probably make it cheaper. And the reason why I'm excited about it is because I always think about um, all these animals everywhere, you know, whether it's at a farm, whether it is for research, but also in zoos. Um, when you get to work with new animals that come in in quarantine and you haven't been able to train them yet, uh, it would be terrific if they never experienced something uh, you know, a negative association with a human for future training purposes, but also if you can make, you know, these very simple habituation approximation, you, you're, it doesn't take too much time. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden you can do all these procedures in a much more animal friendly way. And I think that's critical. Yeah, that is absolutely fantastic. And I guess this is again, that, that meeting of technology and, and the animal world that, you know, 
wouldn't have come together if it weren't for your experience and what you do as an engineer. And this is something well, and that- I, can I add to that? So yes, I'm also please. really a biologist. So it yeah. would be like, um, you know, it's like I, I, so just to sort of give that background. So yeah. my, my bachelor and my master's in aer- is in aerospace engineering, but my PhD and postdoctoral experience and everything after that is actually also in biology. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I have, you know, an extensive background. So I've worked with um, Bob Bailey uh, training uh, and learn to train chickens for for you know week long courses I did all his courses and that that was really critical for me to you know, master these techniques and then indeed the benefit of being an engineer and a biologist so being able to understand natural behaviors is that all of a sudden you realize when you, you know when you know I learned from Bob Bowen change the environment to benefit your training um, you know and I I can modify things because I am used to making things and I think the biggest hurdle in animal training is really um, that like the animal trainers can imagine what the tool would be, but it's just not on the market. And what I'm really excited about, for example, over the past 10 years, you see all these automated feeders coming up for your dog, for example, et cetera. And, you know, that just makes training so much easier. Like if you have a feeder station that you can control for your remote, then the animal doesn't even need to be get used to humans. You could just train just as well. You know, you can shape from a distance and you'll be the first person to say this. So there are huge benefits from technology, uh, as long as it's very simple and very pragmatic. So you need someone who can both train and understand that and make something. And then still, I would say there's some hurdles, but I, but I see a future in front of us where, yeah, there will be more training tools and uh, more animals will be, able, you know, will be able to shape more animals to the benefit of their welfare. Well, I'll be, I'll be contacting you more because as a person that also works in conservation, there's, there's a lot of things that we need in the world of conservation where we do need to be disassociated from the animal for yes. various reasons because we don't want animals to habituate to people and, yes. and using technology definitely helps with that. So, you know, we may, we may be asking you to work on something other than flight. <laughs> well, who knows? Well, I can add that, like, I think technology is really limited in itself. Um, it only works with people who really understand training and observations. Uh, and that, you know, like, how do you observe? How do you base on what you observe shape? And the most important thing, how willing are you to change your own behavior, right? Because like what people always think is like, oh, I'm in control of the animal. No, it's the other way around. You're changing your behavior the whole time. And that is what enables the animal's behavior. Uh, and making that switch, that's the, the most difficult thing to teach, I think, in general. And, and you know, you can, it's great to use equipment, uh, but still you will have to modify the equipment and still you have to modify how people work around the animal. And, and that will, I think, always remain the thing that, takes the most amount of time because humans don't like to change their behavior for an animal <laughs> Some, something innate not with all but like i i really enjoyed learning it but i i can still learn as well so i think that's, that's yeah. true for us all i know i always get the question what's the hard, hardest animal to train and i always say people <laughs> people yes absolutely I now agree. i did want to mention the um some of that information about the um, virtual reality that is in one of your publications that I do believe is a free yes. publication. It's yeah, absolutely. Really- it's on my website and uh, people have, can freely download it. Uh, I specifically published all of this because I want to enable others uh, to improve their approach. And, uh, you know, that all starts with information being available. Uh, and that's also how I, I joined uh, this field, of course. I wanted to uh, learn positive reinforcement training because I saw that was just the best way to go about working with animals in a way that I, you know, feel comfortable with myself as well. And uh, yeah, because I really care about welfare and then uh, I wanted to share this, you know, in the best way possible. So we wrote everything up that we, that we do to train well with animals. Great. I will make sure that people can find that link on this episode webpage. We'll, we'll make sure that's accessible for everybody. Now, you also have birds at home. Am, am I right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, uh, parrotlets. Uh, well, in this case, actually one. Unfortunately, uh, one passed away uh, during the pandemic. Not, of course, due to the pandemic, but like it was uh, not a good time to, to get another bird. But we always keep uh, birds in, in pairs at home. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I love uh, our parrotlets. <laughs> so right now uh, there's a little bit more interaction uh, from our side with the bird because uh, yeah, we feel bad about having just one bird at this moment, but we hope to get a second one again as soon as possible. Um, yeah, and w- that's also one of the things I really love about um, you know having our own pet birds. Like you observe them the whole day and you really get a good idea. And 
like when I started working with birds, I read all these things. Like, for example, I, I love flight, so it would never come across my mind to clip the wings of a bird. I would never do that. I would change the environment or something, but I would never change the bird. <laughs> so um, none of our birds have ever had also the breeders and et cetera. The, uh, the feathers are never clipped. That's also essential because when they develop and uh, they become fledglings, you know, they, they should never be clipped because they, that's the only moment that they can really do the motor learning they need to become proficient flyers. Um, so yeah, they fly around. And another thing that, uh, you know, people work at birds sometimes think is like, oh, you know, you have to keep birds individually and it's easier to work with. And that's, that's true, it's easier to train. But if you're a proficient trainer, um, then that's not necessary. And so what we have at home is uh, they set up with two birds in, in a cage, but with a second cage so that we can move one of the birds if we want to train individually. Uh, but that would be for a couple of minutes because I have never longer training sessions than about two minutes or maybe five minutes, but you have to really stop training sessions uh, because you start making training mistakes, as you might know, over time. So it's keeping those short and many is much better than having long ones. And so we approach this. So I, I train both birds and they work actually also very well together. And then you just have to observe well. Uh, but I, I find this a delight. Uh, and they're really wonderful. Uh, they step up on, your, up on your finger. They do pointing targets. Uh, you might know that you can train uh, animals also with a laser pointer. What you would have to do is you would have to cover up the laser itself so it's not so bright. It really has to be the minimal bright spot that they can still see uh, because then that way their eyes remain protected. And I think that's essential. Uh, but then you can point anywhere and you can touch, the, you can train them to touch the, the pointer with their beak. And you know that way birds will go through the entire cage and you can click for food rewards there. And yeah, I, yeah, I just really enjoyed that as well. And then just having them around in the house is just great. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but it's time for your second secret word. And the secret word is OB. O-B-I. O-B. All right, let's get back to the program. Are you biased? Are there any birds that you find a favorite or you just like all of them? <laughs> yeah, I like all 10,000 species of birds. I don't have a preference. The only reason why I like parrotlets quite a bit is because of their small size and because novice trainers uh, can actually easily train them and uh, different species have different you know require different levels of proficiency and i always work with students and uh, they're you know essential they're really important and support that they get a positive learning experience out of it as well and so that's where parrotlets are great they're easy to train um, and that makes makes all the difference um, but otherwise you know I, I love every species so i i was thinking about um some experiences that I know that are out there that I thought, oh, I bet, I bet you would like these, or, or maybe you've done them already. I don't know. There's a parahawking experience. Have you seen that? In, uh... I actually haven't. So you should tell me about it. Yeah. So uh, Scott Mason started this in Nepal, but now it's in Spain. It's moved to Spain where you basically go paragliding and then oh. the bird of prey um, soars alongside you. Cool. Yeah. No, I, no, I have seen that. Sorry. I didn't know it was referring to that. So one of um, uh, my favorite movies is Wink Migration. I'm not sure if you know that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and so all the birds in that movie were imprinted. So they started off young mm -hmm. and then they tr were trained to fly with paragliders, uh, micro uh, lights uh, with balloons. And, you know, it's just amazing. I just would like, and the idea that they did it for so many species, you know, all the way from cranes to geese, you name it, swans. Um, it's quite incredible and uh, yeah it's like yeah those photos they're beautiful and uh, I've also seen people do that in the wild by the way because you could just soar together with vultures if you wanted to it just if you're a proficient paraglider and you can fly in those areas because they will of course take the best thermals in areas where you have to be a little bit better um, but uh, yeah you, you could fly that way with birds. it's amazing yeah but, I, but it's not like what I do myself but I admire how other people do that and I know they've done that for, for some conservation projects too, yes. to teach the migratory routes. And then there's yeah, a- Ibis is this, like, yeah, uh, yeah there's a wonderful Wild project. Yeah. 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 And then there's um, uh, another one that was filmed um, with the falconer, um, uh, Ken Franklin, who was studying like how fast his peregrine could, mm -hmm. uh, and, and studying how fast it could go and also studying like what 
the the morphing of the body in the stoop. Yes. And so he he um, jumped from an airplane, you know, did skydiving with it and the birds trained to go to a lure. So, you know, he would drop the lure at a certain part and the bird would just really torpedo shape and it got up to 240 miles an hour. I don't know incredible. If that clip, but yeah. Yeah, no, those are incredible, I think. And uh, yeah, the, cool stories around that as well, like uh, small details about, you know, <laughs> they compare the, the, the males versus the females and it turns out that the females die faster and those kind of things. I think that's really, you know, it's, it's fascinating. And um, yeah, it just shows um, what these animals, like what they evolved to fly for. And that's also what I really like. That's also where my preference is for relatively smaller sp species providing more space. I think one of the critical things is trying to provide as much flight space as possible. So it's, they can perform as naturally as possible. You know, I guess nothing better than skydiving together. <laughs> like, <laughs> but it sounds I don't terrific. think I have the guts for that, but <laughs> I'll let those yeah. brave people do it. <laughs> yes. But yeah, you definitely like talking to you just reminds me that there's so much more to this than, than, you know, just a few flaps and a glide. It's just so complex. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there are so many things you can study. Uh, there are also very simple behaviors that are super interesting, I think. So it's like uh, one of the things I've studied in my lab, for example, is how birds um, fly between branches. So, um, you know, they're, of course, foraging the whole time. Uh, that's like what many bird species do. Uh, and uh, they do this all the time in trees, etc. And like, how do they fly optimally between branches so it's not really understood and so I developed new techniques to measure this uh, and what we basically do for example is that we instrument the purchase with uh, force sensors so we can actually measure how they push off and we can measure under which angle they push off and how they time that and then when they fly I've developed these uh, special sort of the best way to describe it to a novice <laughs> scientist, I would say it's like a, a, a bird cage. But the difference is that this cage is instrumented. So we can basically measure um, the pressure forces on all the walls. We don't have to touch the animal in any way, uh, but the bird just flies from perch to perch. When it pushes off, we measure those forces. When it's flying, we film it with high speed cameras. When it lands, uh, we also measure those forces again. And in between, every wing beat, we can measure how the force develops during the wing beat. And this is a technique that I invented that doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, and this took, of course, you know, some years, it was about 10 years of development in total. But then all of a sudden you can study an animal without having to interfere with the animal in any way. We never touch it. So basically we introduce it into the setup with a perch. It's trained to sit on the perch. And so was, the way this works is like the bird sitting in his cage, we open the door, uh, we offer the perch, it steps up voluntarily, as you would see on all the movies and your, your website. Uh, and then we can bring it into a transport cage. And here's where some engineering comes in. What we figured out is that the transport cages that you buy, even the ones that people, professionals use, are not really optimal for training. What you really want to do is you want to have a transport cage with an entrance and an exit. And when you're training, you want to have both wide open. And so that's what we made ourselves. And we also made it entirely transparent. So the bird doesn't go into an enclosure, but it's made of uh, acrylic. And so it can look through it. So it brought in, there's a perch in there that looks like any other perch. And so you can the bird, bring the bird in. Of course you do this with, through you know, approximations as always, uh, but then you can feed from the other side with your hand. So, and the bird will, you'll feed for position. That's how this is called. The bird steps towards you, goes towards that perch. And so then you start training and it's again habituation, but like gradually, not like flooding. It's just uh, making approximation. You close the doors on both sides, they can be closed. Uh, and you start on one side, so the bird can always go out. And that's important for birds that they feel that they can go out. And then you keep on uh, clicking for position and being comfortable and all these wonderful things. You observe their behavior. That's something my students learn through your videos, so, uh, which are great, great parrots uh, video, um, videos on like, how do you observe parrot behavior? It's essential. Uh, what are the eyes doing? What are the feathers doing? How's the bird moving? Is it trying to move away? Sure, we'll bring in the perch. We'll make it easy for you to move out. Uh, it's those kind of things. And then uh, once the bird's comfortable in the inside, we do is you, we made some cloth and then you can bring that down slowly. So then all of a sudden it's a dark gauge. And that's essential because when you walk around, like how do you habituate it for other people walking around? Well, it's a lot of work. 
uh, how do you make habituate for other things? Now it's much easier to make everything dark because then birds get calm. And then you can move the bird to the setup and then you know everything is reversed. And then the other thing that we do, which I also really like is that uh, we always make sure there are other birds in the room where we do the experiments so that birds are always vocalizing with each other because they're group animals, uh, they're social and actually training goes way faster that way too. So the whole idea that you know would slow you down is wrong. Um, but the interesting thing is what you do have to do is you have to cover the cage. Because if they see each other visually, they'll fly, you know, and land on a cage. And that's a lot of training. You don't want to do that. But you can cover the cage and you can make the covering such that they're never covered when you're not training. So they always see each other. Okay, you go train, then you, you know, cover the other birds, and then you go through. And then again, we use the perch. The bird steps up, goes into setup. We point on the other side with our finger or a target stick. You could use a laser if you want to, but we do not do that it's not necessary and it's easier and then the bird flies over click and then it goes back to the cage after you know a session of let's say five flights or ten flights we never have long sessions that's i think the biggest mistake that people can have the training thinking that you could train for an hour or 10 minutes you can't you have to do it shorter especially if you work with novice trainers and uh so that way we've never touched the animal and just makes this trip that's completely rewarded with seats. And there's in between there's breaks there just have their normal cages in the places where we train them uh, or do research so they can sit there together with other birds um, and, uh, and vocalize. And also within the cages, they have direct visual contact. So although you cover the outside, you don't cover the inside uh, and those kind of things. And so it's all those techniques, all those steps that make it really smooth. And then the birds are super relaxed. And what you find is that they actually have very um, well-determined ways of the, in which they push off. So this is where you get the payback in your research because all of a sudden the birds are not stressed. They're not flying off erratically, but thoughtfully because they're trying to minimize the energy expenditure to get that next seat. So it's really foraging. And all of a sudden we learn something about how birds actually forage. And that's the exciting thing. So the science becomes much more valuable as well. And, and I guess this sort of summarizes, this little story summarizes why I'm so excited about training and why I admire people like you and others who do this full time. You know, I do it for research is one of my tools. Uh, I became proficient in it, but I know that if I would work full time like you do or others do, uh, I would become even better. So there's, there's always time, space to learn and improve. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm totally impressed with, with what you do. So uh, I don't know that you have to spend time getting better at it. I think, I think uh, one of the things you said that really, you know, stood out to me, especially is, is the quality of the data. I think that's, yes. that's really key. Um, you know, I've often thought about this when you, when I read journal articles and, and you try to read between the lines, you know, there's a little, that my trainer brain is working on that going, yes. I wonder, I wonder the quality of the, of the data that they collected, you know, if the animal was comfortable or, or relaxed or not, you see, um, there's, there's, a. Um, uh, oh, is it the three R's uh, out there yep. now? You know, when they talk oh, about- those have been a lot around for a very long time. Yeah. And also keep in mind, so that's one of the benefits. I, so I've like been um, educated in the Netherlands and uh, they, they have a very good program for uh, how to learn, how to work with animals. So um, for those who don't like animal research, they might enjoy hearing that uh, they're phasing out every form of animal research in the Netherlands that's invasive, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they, they're really a push towards that already. It's very strong. But the free R's have been around forever. And um, like, you know, decades before I, I got educated. So my training included also talking with people who don't like animal experiments, who, who oppose those. And we had to have, and of course, there were people selected who were open to discussing this with scientists in a friendly manner. I think that's important, but otherwise it was completely transparent and completely clear, you know, I object against this type of research, et cetera. So you get a real good idea about what the perspective is of people who don't see the direct benefit of research. Now, I think personally that research is essential for a society, but I also strongly believe, and I did that already when I entered that course, that, uh, you know, the ethics of animal research is key and that it's a privilege to be able to study an animal. And when you have that privilege, I think it's essential to do all the paperwork always. And like, you know, every single study I do, even though these completely voluntary behaviors, uh, you know, before we can even do anything, I've done all the paperwork describing every procedure, 
everything that has to do with husbandry, everything from down to the food, to the light schedule, you name it, how we interact. And then the most important thing, how we teach the students that we work with how to uh, work uh, with animals. And that's where I use positive reinforcement training. And they learn that whole technique. So all of that is there included. And I, and I think that's key. I think we have to have the best possible approaches. And that's why I said, there's always something that we can further improve. Uh, even though I've uh, learned how to train and use all these techniques, I've, you know, every thing, single step I can think of, of improving, you know, I, I would make. And I always have my eyes open. And that's why I like, uh, you know, experts like you who provide, for example, that's, that I think is really the future, like, you know, like dreaming about every veterinarian everywhere in the world uh, knowing how to work based on post positive reinforcement and for ev for the larger size animals where it's well within range, uh, range you know, doing the sirens training that you mentioned uh, on your website and show how you can do that step by step. Makes a little sense to me, but just have to make this more efficient. So when I'm saying, you know, how, uh, still having my eyes open, it's not like I don't see those sort of techniques, but I'm thinking, well, how can you do it in an economic way so you can scale it up? And I think that's one of the open challenges in animal training to make it affordable in terms of number of people hours and uh, to automate some of it and then really benefit the welfare of animals. And I'm not talking necessarily only about research. I'm really thinking, because I think the nice thing about research is that everything is super strictly regulated, but I'm really thinking about uh, all the production animals out there uh, and so on, like all these places where we have animals, like how much we could improve their welfare um, if we roll this out at a much bigger scale where it's still affordable, uh, but when people, you know, buy a chicken in, in, the, in the supermarket or some pork or whatever, that an animal really had a good life. And not only in terms of space, but also every interaction with a human was positive. I think that would make things really good. Yeah. Well, and I think it's, it's, you know, having conversations like this where we share information so people can see how it can be applied and, and sharing the ideas like you have with us today so that people can learn and that there are ways to do this instead of just keep doing it the way we've always done it. Keep making progress. Well, we have to move on. We have, we have to keep on learning. And I think that's the exciting thing about science in general uh, and research. It is really focused on learning. And I believe everyone is interested in learning a new technique when they see what the opportunity is. So uh, yeah, that's why uh, the work that you're doing, making you know this technique available to a wide number of people. So I, I can, I, and in addition, so I think that's essential. I think it's also essential, you know, like having seen how much like uh, the training of pets has improved. So if you look at all these wonderful courses where people learn how to work with their dog based on positive reinforcement, and then after that think it's second nature it's like oh yeah of course we always done this well no it's actually that has been hard work from several people making it available you know and and rolling it out and i think that just improved the life of our pets a lot and so yeah i'm really excited about that and then um yeah if you think further if you just think bigger and that's i guess why i'm a scientist i always think a little bit further beyond what there currently is you know, from my perspective, if you think about 12 year olds, children, you know, wouldn't it be normal even, I should just consider a normal thing to teach children once they have an age where they can have a little bit of, um, yeah, they go beyond the playfulness and know how to take responsibility. Wouldn't it be great if we would teach them all and just make this part out of, of our schools, how to positively interact with animals, you know, because like, that would make such a difference. Of course, we all know that, you know, animals are key for children when they're growing up, but we also know that some children pull on the tails of the dog or, or of the cat. And I'm quite sure that there is an optimal age where they're susceptible and interested in really learning like how to engage positively and using positive reinforcement. And like when I learned this much later, of course, <laughs> but I found it one of the most valuable things I've learned in my life because it opened up a world that I didn't know exists. The idea that I know how to work with any wild animal uh, by, you know, with, through small approximations, shaping, wouldn't, you know, being able to communicate through this very thin communication line, you know, which is just based on changing my behavior to get a response from the animal. That's just, yeah, incredible. It, it benefits my research and, you know, it's just only a small part of my research, but. I think as a human, I feel I've grown by learning that. So 
Uh, and I think it would be very inspirational for children uh, to learn this if you do this well. Now, I'm not the expert on how to roll that out, but I think that's, for example, something where we can all still make a huge step. And I think that would benefit animal welfare everywhere. Well, I think the work that you're doing is is another avenue to to reach those people. I mean, there may be people that are are super interested in the technology and that leads them down the pathway to... Well, I actually think it's like, I'm a scientist. So I, I, I have a broader perspective just because of, because of my curiosity and because I like to open, uh, to think openly. Uh, mm-hmm. But I actually think this is where the opportunity is really is like, if we could connect people like you with uh, schools and educators, uh, you know, I, I'm, you know, an educator at the university as a professor, you know, like I teach students who are already very far away from <laughs> this age where I think people should learn this. Uh, so, but I, I just see this as something that maybe one day we'll realize that this is really worth it. And, you know, it's within reach. Like I've, I've learned how to train animals uh, by uh, training chickens. They're really the best model for learning how to train because uh, they are engaged with training for the whole day. They they've normally feed the whole day. They're more than willing to train the whole day. Of course, there are breaks in between and stuff like that, but they're very easy to work with. They're also portable. They're not out of reach in terms of like, if you think about an educational system, they're the classic model, I think, for learning to really train because you have to be fast and you have to be a good observer. Uh, do- training dogs much easier. And, uh, and so, you know, there, there's all these opportunities, but I don't think I'm the expert to all that. I'm just, I'm just saying it because I hope someone is listening. I think, well, maybe I could try this or do this because of course still a lot needs to be done. But I think it, this would be really something that would roll out uh, this type of training, you know, all over the world. It really, you have to start out at a younger age and make it available, uh, you know. You are a great spokesperson for training. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. You're an advocate. I love it. <laughs> well, I'm just very excited by how much more positive the interaction is through training. And I think that's also why I brought things up. Like, I think, you know, improving training techniques where you can socially train animals is, is a huge step forward. I think that's still, still some places where people could do that more. Uh, but like we need to get more experts who can teach us how to do that well. It's actually not easy, but mm-hmm. it is completely possible and it really improves the welfare. It's the same with training with preferred food items, making sure that animals are always well fed and yeah. have a limited access or healthy access, but not less. So, like to me, those are key principles. Um, and that's where we need experts who are really good at training and then who communicate that to others, like how to do this. And it varies from species to species. So we have to openly share what we learn. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a big advocate for that healthy relationship with food. I think we can create problems where animals become, well, I, don't, I think for a lack of a better word, they become sort of a very, very obsessed with when is that next food item going to yeah. be available to me. You don't want that. Unhealthy behaviors. Yes. And- we don't we don't want to create those situations well, i think we never want to have something like that and it's not necessary um and like think it all boils down to humans being willing to change their behavior and that's also how i explain it. anyone like who i'm teaching well and it takes a while before i bring this up of course but then i say well actually if you look at this um you know like we're changing our behavior and like basically we're you know remotely controlled by the animal it's yeah. <laughs> because you have to respond to the animal's behavior so the animal is cueing you in some way of course that's not how we formally build it into our language around training but in fact we're observing the behavior and the only you know the only choice we have is deciding to work with the behavior that's offered but that's it but after that our behavioral chain is starting and we have to do that exactly right because if we don't do it exactly right we're not efficient and we're not going to get that behavior because we have to capture it and then develop it yeah i've often said the best animal trainers were the ones who um, were sensitive to the animal's body language and changed and responded um, and changed their own body language changed what you're doing in response to what the animal was doing to make that animal more comfortable and relaxed you know and and, and then you're able to get, you know, whatever next approximation you need. Um, you know, that's kind of a, a simplistic explanation there. <laughs> but, but those well, people like have a good sensitivity. It, I agree. But what I like about this simplistic, that's another thing I would like to add. So I think another thing that's really important uh, in teaching how to train animals is so, so I think what is really, so I, I'm multidisciplinary. I work in multiple fields. I, you know, I'm fluent in math. I can 
blow someone away, do math, and then people say, oh, you're so smart. But that's not why I do the math. I'm not interested in that. And so you can go from place to place. And what you'll see is that scientists introduce really, um, yeah, uh, fancy names for things, or they use acronyms and all those kinds of things. And because I'm multidisciplinary, actually in my writing, I really avoid all acronyms. Like I, I am against acronyms. I'm also against technical language. Why? Because as soon as I use that, it becomes less, um, less available for others. That doesn't mean I'm perfect. If you, someone is listening, to, oh, I'll read David's paper. Like, oh, that was quite something. But then I, I recommend them to also read some of the other papers you know, from other people who are keeping more of a technical language. And then there's a difference. You know, when I speak to someone from the media and that person says, well, I could actually read your paper. It was understandable. And then I'm like, yes, that was the goal. And I think this is a step we have to make in animal training as well. Like, you know, R plus, R minus, like how are you ever going to teach this to a kid? Like you could, but then you have to use it every day. Are you, if you, if I teach you to use that language to train um, for a year, let's say we work for a year. And then so for some reason for five years, you don't have any time. Will you be able to then pick it up again after five years? using that language? The answer is probably not. Probably you're looking at what was, again, that table, you know, like what, what was in what, what quadrant? And what's cool about using the quadrant is that it makes it really scientific and fancy. But I, you know, the ideas are the same. So my idea is like, can you find the simplest way to explain it to someone? Um, and that is the best way. And that, that's what I'm still struggling uh, with. Like, I, you know, I have all these books. I've read everyone's stuff. Uh, all the way to the psychologist going all the way with different, you know, <laughs> schedules of reinforcement, you name it. Um, but there are simpler ways to explain this because in the end, animal training is not that complex. It's very simple. But um, yeah, it's not easy, right? That's how people say, Bob would say something like this. <laughs> so, uh, and others as well. So I think that's one of those open challenges. Like how do you translate this knowledge in a way that anyone can understand it and it becomes more intuitive. And I think that's still an open challenge to some degree. And so. one that has been going on for many, many years, if you look at the literature from the behavior analysts, they have struggled with that very question about how, why, why isn't behavior analysis more embraced by the rest of the world when they, you know, they look at that science as like, it's, it's this wonderful gift that could save everybody, but most people, respond as how you're saying that because it's so difficult to understand because it's like having to learn a new language it's yes. not very accessible and so that that conversation has been going on for many 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 years and i think you're right that uh it still hasn't been solved yet because it hasn't been very user friendly. I, you know, I, I, I try, I mean, I'm, and I flip flop sometimes, you know, sometimes I flip into the two technical jargon and then I go back to, okay, let's, let's make this a little bit more accessible. I think the nice thing about, about, um, you know, going to places and training animals is, you know, you video, you video what you do. And then you, you know, that kind of helps explain it. You yes. Just, you just it see does. it happening and you go, Oh, okay. That makes sense. And that, well, and, the, and the devil is in the detail, right? Like there's some parts of like, how, hmm, how do I get an animal to voluntarily participate in the blood draw, which like, you know, it, it, now it's established, but like go two decades back and you look at zoos and it was not established. Right. So that like, this is, this is really growing now. How do you do this? Well, you have to make sure that vets can understand everything that's going on, but also caretakers, because they're the person who uh, like, you know, has the most time with the animal. And if that person could do it, that would be incredibly empowering because the, the hours that the vet has to make, you know, cost more money. Let's be practical. In the end, it's a business zoo, right? So, but they also really care about welfare. And there are many zoos are working really hard for that. So how do you make it accessible? Oh, well, if it's the caretaker I'm working with, well, how useful is it to, you know, bring this this language in? And it turns out that all the literature that it could read is unreadable for that per, for that reason, and that means that it cannot even self-study easily. So, uh, yeah, we're really holding back progress, I feel. And then the challenge, of course, that you would have, like, you know, and the same for me, like, it is just because I'm a well-established scientist in my field that even if I explain things simple, people will know, oh, well, David really knows his stuff because I read his papers and look at all this new stuff he invented. Like they, they sort of know that I have a certain level so they could trust that. But if you don't have that sort of automated with it, then it's like, well, you know, how are you ever going to take me seriously? Well, I have to speak the same language. 
And that's what I see, for example, when I teach students, many students become extremely good at the technical language and the acronyms because that shows that they are really knowledgeable. That's why they can communicate to others, I am an expert, and they will be taken seriously because they are just starting. But when you become more senior, you don't need this. Uh, you know, that people would know you and would have know, known your work. And I think that's sort of the trap that, uh, and it's not uh, specific to animal, the animal training world. It's really in general, like it is important to be taken serious. It is important to be able to communicate that you are an expert and you really know your stuff. Someone else needs to be able to trust that. And that's where the technical language has its function. But if we want to roll this out, and you know make every like teach every caretaker how to use habituation at minimum i would say it would be, it would be great you know like if they would know that and then uh, second using positive reinforcement really realizing that when you bring in food you're training the animal like many people think like okay you know i'm not training animals i just feed animals and i'm not talking about caretakers but just anyone at home as well well keep in mind whenever you pet your animal whenever uh, you provide food of any kind whenever you provide any uh, uh, you know, reinforcing or punishing behavior, you're training, there is no moment you're not training an animal, even if you're not interested, you're doing it. So th this importance to have a simple language so that someone can understand what they're doing and that they're always engaging in a way that changes behavior, um, I think is really essential. So that's where I think, you know, if you think about the future of animal training, um, yeah, it's interesting to make things like to get more technical tools because we can easily both see as experts that that would really increase efficiency and make a lot possible where currently we're struggling a little bit because we can't work remotely with animals. You have to have humans often in the loop, Let fewer humans, is better. But then this other challenge, like how you do you actually engage people who don't necessarily have a university or college degree. You also don't need to have this or they do have it, but you they do it like me like for me it's just one tool like i'm also doing all this other stuff how do you make it really easy to learn how do you make it really accessible yeah to me that that is one of the big question marks where i think we can make real progress yeah well i don't know that we're going to figure it out in our hour here David. i agree <laughs> <laughs> next time next time we'll figure it out and we'll save the world <laughs> Well, what I really hope is that I will be able through future interviews and seeing other experts that will get there step by step. If we know, you know, what the frontier is and what the opportunity is, it's basically an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then we can work on it. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think, I think, uh, I, I will say this. I think we both have made some inroads into that, you know, obviously with you teaching your students and, and the publications that you've prepared that are user-friendly and talk about some of the things that you've done in your labs and certainly um, the the media attention that explains in, I think, quite user-friendly language what's going on in your lab. And hopefully some of the resources that I've made are a little bit user-friendly too. So we've made, we can, we can feel good about some baby steps in the right direction, I hope. Yeah, no, I, I really love your website. I think uh, it has wonderful illustrations of what's possible with animal training and also how to go about it step by step. And there are also other resources out there. I see people make real efforts um, and it makes a difference. It really does. Absolutely. And you're, you're definitely making a difference with the work you're doing there, not only with the training, but of course, with the technology, moving science forward and helping us learn about flight, which is just so fascinating. It's exciting. Yeah. So I will be sure. Well, actually, I know, I know some of the links that I'm going to be sharing, but is there um, anything uh, else that we should share? Is there any ways that people might want to participate in some of the work that you're doing? That's a great question. Well, um, it's unfortunately true that I don't have as much time as you would think I might have. Just because of my research, I, I work with so many students. So uh, that, that's really, uh, I'm somewhat limited, but if people are really interested in learning more, I, I uh, provide every information about what I do, also all the techniques that I developed, et cetera. They're all published, everything is available. Um, and if people are interested just looking at like, how do we train? There's a nice uh, New York Times science take showing in a video um, explaining like how we use positive reinforcement training. Uh, so even that exists out there. And uh, yeah, and if they're interested in learning a little bit more and want to contact me, they could just Google me. They will easily find my uh, email address and, and can shoot me an email. Uh, and if it's really well, it's something I can help with and make a difference, I will definitely help out. That's how I definitely go about it. 
Awesome. Well, you have shared so much today. It's been amazing. So thank you so much for doing this today, David. My pleasure. It was wonderful to talk with you. See what I mean about impressive guests? I wasn't kidding, was I? There's so many things about that interview that really stick with me. I think, of course, the most important thing is the attention to detail on animal welfare. That, of course, is near and dear to my heart. And I love how animal training is helping us learn so many important things about flight. And I tell you, I'm really intrigued by that whole virtual reality setup with the cameras and the ways to reduce stress for animals if we do need to restrain them for certain things, especially with birds. That's a really great idea. And as mentioned, we'll be sure that all the links are available for you in the episode webpage so that you can check out those resources and hopefully implement some of the things that you learned in this episode for the animals that you care for. Lots of great information in this particular interview. And of course, that's the whole idea here is so that we can learn and share and improve animal welfare everywhere. So again, a great big thank you to Dr. David Lentink for all the information that he shared with us today. And I hope you'll join us for another episode in the future. It's really great having you all here. And of course, a great big thank you to all of our guest experts. See you next time. Hey, do you like this podcast? I certainly hope so. It's free, awesome content about the coolest topics in the world like animals, training, behavior, science, and the experts in these fields. The good thing about this podcast is the more this information is shared, the more animals benefit. The way you can help get this podcast to more people is by rating and reviewing it. A good review helps get it featured on searches. And guess what? Your good behavior gets noticed around here. We'll randomly pick a winner from all the reviews given to receive a free one-year membership to the online education program, AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com. And if you all are super participatory and do a lot of reviews, we will do this as often as four times a year. But if we don't get too many, maybe it's just a two times a year thing. We'll have to see how it goes. If you're not sure how to give a review, just go to AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com backslash podcast and look for the big green button for instructions. If you liked what you heard today, visit AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com for more quality content on animal training. You'll find courses, community, and extensive video examples from my consulting work around the world. We'd love to have you join our force-free family.